Are you thinking about your uh, the, the the best phrasing you can come up with? Let me just say exactly what we're going to do now with this beta uh, decay. We're going to derive an expression for the decay rate of a beta emitter using the golden rule. The decay rate of a beta emitter using golden rule. Okay, so Fermi golden rule, if I remember correctly, showed how it how a perturbation or a small perturbation would affect it in going from an initial state to a final state. <coughs> Do you know the formula? No, I'll have to talk to man. Right. Anyone else? P I I T F. No, that's that's how it starts. The probability of starting in a state I ending up in a state F. Four over H bar. Four H bar squared. Something like this. I tend to forget the details. There was no pi. No, there was no pi in there. <coughs> well, this part is certainly in there. Can somebody look up the numerical factor that's, that's in there? Uh, it's 4 over h bar squared. Like this? Yeah. Okay. And there's something with signs coming next. Sign omega i over 2 divided by omega i squared. Something like this? The sine of squared. Oh, omega squared. And no the there is. I think it was this. Oh, and this is square two. Yeah. Memory serves. Okay, there we go. This is the one that we actually derived. Started out with basic for quantum mechanics, came up with this one ultimately, and this rule we can turn into a more interesting rule. Because this one just tells you if you start out in a quantum state I, you end up in a quantum state F. By the way, these are not just quantum states, they're very specific quantum states. This is me asking. I and F. These states or these these cats? Initial state and the final state. I, I agree. Of the bit emission. Mm, I'm not hearing what I want to hear because you're right. This initial state and the final state. And yes, we're going to apply to beta emission. Mm -hmm. But in order to get this rule in the first place, these and also the f's themselves. Eigenstates of energy. There were eigenstates of energy. In other words, that if we had an energy operator, which I in the derivation calls H is zero, H is not, it would give us back with 100% certainty what the energy is of that state. And that's very important, not just for the derivation, otherwise this wouldn't come out, this particular uh, golden rule. But it's also very important from a, a mathematical sense, because energy eigenstates are also momentum eigenstates. You can prove that very easily for yourself if you want. It might even be a question on your midterm. Because you, you can prove that this holds. That the commutator of H0 and P squared is zero. And if you recall what the commutator is, it tells you a number of things that measuring one and then measuring the other one uh, gives you the same result as measuring this one first and then the other one. So the, the, the order of, of, of measurements doesn't matter. And that itself is equivalent to saying that H0 uh, and P squared have the same set of eigenstates. So that means if this is an eigenstate of the energy of H, it's also an eigenstate of P squared. And that's very important from an experimental point of view. Namely, if you're an experimentalist and you want to compare your, uh, your theory to your experiment, what people typically do is to take a nucleus, some nucleus the number of protons and neutrons in there, you shoot some particle up there and see it and then see what happens. You can use the form a golden rule for this because this is the initial state. And then this turns into, well, I don't know, some other thing. 
maybe it will split apart or something like that. Depending on all kinds of quantum mechanical rules, you can have initial state and a final state. But in order to compare this initial state to that initial state, you as an experimenter have to know exactly what your initial state is. Otherwise, you cannot use this rule. You need to know what the initial state is. Fortunately, if you just make sure that your nucleus that you're shooting your, 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 your thingies on is standing still, has zero momentum, you can easily do that in the laboratory. And this one, you know what the momentum is because you're the one shooting the thing. And these you can just measure what comes out. Then you exactly know what these are. So you really want to have Hamiltonian eigenstates because there are also momentum eigenstates and momentum is something you can easily control in your laboratory and as a result you can easily compare your initial and your final states and everything that happens in between by comparing to the golden rule. So it's very important, these are not just any states, not just some initial state or final states, they're uh, eigenstates of the Hamiltonian and therefore also of the momentum. Just saying, you, you might want to do this for yourself. Say with a small wink of the eye. It's not very difficult. And then leave that question out of the exam. I mean, that would be such a uh, low life thing to do, but I. <laughs> okay, so what else? This is very important. It gives you the probability. If you start in this st energy eigen stage, you end up in that energy eigen state, and you see it's a function of time. Now, if you want to turn this into a decay rate, how often you expect this to happen in time, the only thing you have to do is divide this by time. What comes out in Martin is called big W. You have to divide this by time. There you have that. So now you have a decay rate. How often it happens per time, or decay frequency, you might say, something like that. You remember the next step? This is two lectures ago that we did this. Excuse me, it was Tuesday last week. It's something to do with not knowing exactly what final state you would get. This assumes that you start in a definite initial state and a definite final state. Now quantum mechanics is fickle. You don't know, usually you don't know what the final state is going to be. This one you can control because you're the, you're the one shooting the particles on each other. The <laughs> final state you don't know. What you usually get is a whole spectrum of final states. And if you want to get the probability for any of these final states to come out, so you only know that you start with this initial state and some of these final states will come out, you have to sum the probabilities. And if the final states happen to be a continuum, that means that you have to integrate over your final states. You might remember this. So this is some sort of abstract integral over final states. We actually did that calculation. Do you know the formula? Uh, that's when we made the change of variable. Um, uh, I'm not sure we did that. We 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 should we did in terms of W made the integral in terms of W. Oh yes yes we did we we did do that one yes. In fact, you can prove for yourself that this integral will give you back. Um, a times pi. You can prove this for yourself, just calculus. So if you do that here, your integration, you end up with A in this case is W over 2, excuse me, 1 over 2, and there are some integration variables that you shift around with. We actually did this, this one, so let me just give you the result. This is why I put the pi up there just a second ago, I was mixing up two formulas. H1, Hi squared. And you get this rho that you also might remember. The rho is very important. Because we have to calculate it in a second. Anyone physics? The rho is? 
should be density. two. It's a density, exactly. Density of states. Density of states. What does it mean? You're right. It's it's called the density of states. How close all the final states are to each other. Uh, that's a nice way of putting it. Uh, Is that equivalent to what, what I would like to say, what I would like to call a thing? Let's think about that for a second. Density of state is, is if you have an energy, st an energy value, how many final states F have that particular value for the energy? Th that, is what, that is what it is. It counts how many eigenstates there are of a particular uh, value of energy. How many? Eigenstates of particular energy. And as we discussed last week, there's a good thing that that thing is there because it also counts for degeneracy, that there are final, that there are different final states, but it has, it has the same energy. Okay, so that, this is our starting point. This is all just a recap of what we did before. Now, what we're going to do, we're going to look at a beta decay. You can use this for all kinds of uh, uh, final initial states, yes? So we're going to use it for a beta. Now my plan is to go through the calculation. So we're going to calculate this thing here. And in a moment we have to do another integral for reasons that will become apparent in a second. And we get a final expression. Final expression is called Sargent's rule, and yes, that is part of the midterm that you know what that rule is. I can already tell you what the what the outcome is. By the way, you will find that this rate here will be proportional to the amount of energy to the fifth power, different from initial and final state. So if you start with this nucleus and you shoot some particle on there or so, and it has this particular amount of energy, and then you look at what happened in the end, and you look at what the nucleus and its decay products have as their energy, there's an energy difference between both beginning and final states. This energy difference you put in here, due to the fifth power, and it tells you the decay rate with some numerical factor in front. We're going to calculate what the numerical factor is. This rule, the fact that this is true, that it goes with the fifth power, again, it's called Sargent's rule. Here's a nice tidbit to know. Um, this accounts for the enormous amount of range in decay rates for beta. One of the exercises that I would like to discuss with you is uh, what typically the range is. I looked up some of these isotopes that decay via beta decay. And some of them go with milliseconds. And there are also, there's also one that I found. There's a decay or half time bigger than the age of the universe. It's an enormous difference. And this is the reason why. Because if the difference between initial and final state, the energy is a some number, it goes to the fifth power. And you might remember from your Taylor series, calculus or so, that this rule holds. So you can tell that even if you have only, say, 20% difference, you get 100% difference in your outcome. It builds up very fast. So that's why. This is all Sargent's rule. So this is the outcome. And the rest is just doing the math. So let's do the math. To make it more specific, beta decay, we're going to do, look at the following process. We're going to have a nucleus, has n neutrons and z protons. This is the initial state. And it will decay into Some other thing, plus, well, we have to be specific. Uh, it doesn't really matter for the calculation. The rule will be numerically the same for both, but just for definiteness, help me, is that a word? Definiteness, definitiveness, definity. Definity. Yeah. <laughs> just for <laughs> which? It sounds correct, right? <laughs> sounds correct-ish. OK, for definity. <laughs> We have to choose whether we're going to look at beta plus or beta minus. Again, it doesn't matter for the calculation, so I would say just like make it a beta, a beta minus. That's the one that happens more often. Why is that, by the way? Of the two, why is beta plus less likely than a beta minus? Do you know? Because, uh, because it's bigger, 
bigger atoms usually have more neutrons than pro protons? No, there's going to be electrons in, uh, in, uh, in our Earth, no? So we're more likely to see an electron to pop out instead of a positron to pop out. It's like antimatter and matter or something like that. Yes, but why is that? I mean, you're right, you're more likely to find an electron than a positron. Yeah, yeah. In, in, in just in wild nature, but we're talking about a process where both of them could pop out. Yeah. And if you look at your quantum electrodynamics, it's one step further than we're doing here, then you find that the probability for both is the same, just for, as a naked process. But yet, in beta, you find that positrons are less likely to occur. It has to do with the energy, it has to do with the mass, to be more specific. While you think about it, I'll just write down the decay products of this one. So we're going to make it a beta minus. I have to remind myself that it means that one of the neutrons goes one up down, yes. This one goes up, it's beta minus, okay. So what you get out is an electron plus a neutrino. Because a lepton number and such has to be an anti-neutrino. There you go. But the anti-part, the anti-particle part is not very important. You're right, by the way. I mean, the, 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 you're likely, more likely to find a... Uh, particle than an antiparticle. It's an unsolved mystery in, in physics why yeah, you have more particles. Yes, the asymmetry in, uh, in, in baryons. Or another, uh, this, putting it the same way. <coughs> um, well, let's not put it in any other way. I mean, this is, this, is really just a, the, this is really just one of the big mysteries of the universe why you are more likely to find uh, particles than antiparticles. But from a creation point of view, Par uh, particles and antiparticles are created in the same process. So if you create one, you also create the other one. Somebody can answer, why, why, why? Yeah. Sorry, if this happens, we're assuming that the, the mass of the neutron is a little bigger than the, the proton. And yes. so if you do it vice versa, it would take more energy yeah, for yeah. The, just the mass times being right in the yes. energy. That's the whole reason. Mm -hmm. Neutron is somewhat more... <laughs> a little competition going on there. All right, <laughs> that was good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're more likely... Oh, a, 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 a neutron is, is slightly more heavier than a proton is. Yeah. So that means that turning a neutron in a, in, in, in a proton, proton will actually create energy, will give you extra energy. It doesn't take energy, it gives it back. And that's a good thing for the nucleus because it wants to lose its energy, yes? So that's a process that happens much more spontaneously than the other way around. If you were to take one of the protons and turn it into a neutron to get beta plus, you would actually have to put in energy or get energy from somewhere to create the extra mass. And that's, that's much more difficult. So that's the reason. So okay, well again, for our numerical calculation, that doesn't matter. So what we have here now is this particular process. Here's the initial state, and here is the final state. There you go. Now, we need to have this density of states. Because there's many ways that you can create a final state that looks like this, that consists of a remaining nucleus, an electron, and a neutrino. Because the electron might fly in this direction, and maybe the neutrino flies in that direction. It's one final state. But we might also have that the electron flies in that direction, the neutrino flies in some other direction. It's another final state. The same decay products the same final energy too, it's just the directions are different. That gives you different final states. You have a whole group of final states. So this is where this part comes into play. So what we have to do now is find the density of states for this particular outcome. One of the exercises was to try and look up how that works. It's actually in Martin's book too. Here's a question. Has anyone looked it up? How to do this? What? How to calculate a density of states. We are, of course, here for that reason. Let me 
see if that's correct facing here. Oh, we know how to do it. Is that with like the DN and everything? Yes. You have to take the states for the electron and the yes. neutrino and then yes. also compare the energies. And that is the idea, yes. Yeah. It's complicated. Well, it's not that complicated. It's just a matter of counting mostly. Okay, uh, let's see if I. Yep, here it is. It's not particularly complicated, but we are going to need it. You might want to take good, good notes of this because you might find if you're going to follow courses in quantum field theory later, whether it is here or maybe at your master's or something like that, or in chemistry or in solid state physics, this, this, tip, tip, this kind of calculation is going to be very important. Again, it's not very difficult, but you do have to know how to do it. Okay. Uh, I'm going to calculate the density of states for one of these two particles. doesn't matter which one. The calculation will be the same for both. So this is going to be the density of states for the electron. All right. Now, if I were to take an, an electron in empty space, and you do your quantum mechanics, then you know famously from quantum mechanics that you run into problems. Because in the absence of any potential, your Schrodinger equation will give you a solution, e to the power of something, which is not uh, uh, normalizable. Well, you get, or saying the same thing in different words, you get a plane wave solution. You cannot normalize a plane wave. So what people do is that they just take this particle and put it in a box, so a hypothetical box. And then they calculate what the uh, energy states are going to be within that box. And you might know from your quantum mechanics that because of putting it in a box, your energy states become discretized. I don't want to go through the whole calculation of that particular part because I, I would guess that you would know how this works. So I'm just going to draw what it looks like. Here's the box. And for what word did we just invent? Definity? Definiteness? For definiteness, I'm going to say it's a cubical box. of volume L to the power 3. And we're going to assume that the box is impenetrable. In other words, it's sort of a potential well, a problem that we solved before. But in this case, it's not a spherical potential well, which was difficult, if you, if you remember. It's much more easy. You will find if you solve the Schrodinger equation. Let's put it here. There's the origin right over there. Here's origin. That... <coughs> product of signs and each of these signs looks like this. I have to ask you if this looks familiar, if you've seen this before. If not, it's fine, it's just I need to know. It's a product of signs. Each comes with this number right over there. Yeah, looks familiar. Now you have an nx, an ny, and an nz. And all of these three numbers can only be integers. <coughs> so that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 or so. To get from the Schrodinger equation to this result, I, you have to make a number of approximations, or excuse me, assumptions, boundary conditions. And one of them is that at the boundaries, you won't find the particle. Now that means that if... Um, your, if you're a zero in x direction, I'm missing something here. Of course. Excuse me. Let me just rewrite this for a second. It was correct, but I was missing a part. There you go. There you go. And then the k's are exactly the expression that I wrote down just a second ago, which is n x y z over L times pi. There you go. So missing the x, y, and z part. There it is. Again, this is just solving the Schrodinger equation. And I put two boundary conditions in there, and that is that at x is 0, y is 0, and z is 0, 
the psi should be zero because you, you, you have to have a zero probability of finding your particle at the boundary of the box because the impenetrable walls. But also, when x, y, and z equal l, when you're at the other side of the box, then too, you should have psi is zero. Now that second boundary condition gives rise to this discretation that you have over there. Yes? Uh, do you need a normalization constant in there? Yes, there's a normalization constant for the whole thing. But I'm not going to worry about that because the only thing I, wor I, I want to worry about now is um, um, is the normalization, oh, excuse me, is this part. That's the part that's going to be important. Okay, now. Again, this directly follows from quantum mechanics that these k's are related to the energy by the following relation. Just out of curiosity, do you feel that we have to go through this calculation? I'm, I'm very happy to do it. If not, I suggest that I don't. Because from going from here to here is just solving Schrodinger equation for a particularly simple system. Um, I think you can easily do this for yourself. If you have any difficulty with it, and we have some time left today, we can just go through that calculation at some point. But here's what we get. Here you see immediately, so this is quantum mechanics, yes? Forget about the details of how we got there. Now this part already tells you that energy is discretized. Because for every k value, and k is related to n, so for every combination of n, x and y and z, where these n's are integers, you get a certain energy, and there's multiple energies, uh, there's multiple n, uh, n, y and z's that give you the same energy. So it's degenerate. And what we do have to do now is calculate for a given energy how much of these states are there, or, to put it in other words, how many combinations of n values, n, x, n, y, and n, z, are there such that they give the same energy? That number is by definition the energy the density of states. So that's what we need to do. And the trick that people do for this, I love this trick, and again, if you want to do solid state physics later, or maybe quantum field theory, you're going to run and do to this trick a lot, is that they say, well, so look at this. This sort of is like a vector, yes? The length of some vector k, uh, k, where k, the vector, is just defined as kx, ky, and kz. And you know, mathematical physicists, they love making vector spaces out of things. So they just say, well, in that case, let's make this vector space. So three-dimensional space with the k's along the sides. And if you want, if you take one definitive energy, Then it tells you, well, in this vector space, that the sort of spans up a sphere. A sphere with, a sphere with radius k. <coughs> Here's that sphere. There's a sphere. It has a surface. Each point on this surface, by definition of what a sphere is, Forget about physics, it's mathematics. By definition of what a sphere is, each point on a sphere, on the surface of a sphere, has by definition the same value for this particular outcome. Or in other words, the same energy. So what, what I want you to take from this is that the surface of the sphere corresponds all k, x, k, y, and k, z combinations that have the same energy. Does that make sense? It literally says here the energy goes with some constant times the radius of the sphere squared. Yes. Because <coughs> but the surface has infinite points, but we are only interested in yes. Yeah, ex you're exactly right. So that's the next step. Because if literally each and every point on the surface of this sphere would correspond to this energy, I would just have to take the surface of this sphere, 
which is one eighth of a full sphere, so one eighth of four pi r squared, and I would have the number of states with that energy. But it's discretized. It's right over here. The case are not allowed to have each value. So taking the whole surface of this thing is not correct. What we need to do instead is take only discretized points. And all the points are discretized. There are all these points. Only these points are allowed states. Because the k's are discretized, corresponds to some points. So one trick that we could do is just take the surface of the sphere, so we get the whole surface, and divide it by how much space, how much surface each point typically takes. Th that's a nice trick that we can do. And that's in fact a trick that people use. Now they use one little step in between, and that is that they start with the volume of the sphere. It will make sense in a moment why they do that. But first let's just go through the calculation. The volume of the sphere What is it? It's a yeah. Four divided by three, maybe by R cubed. Okay. R cubed. Let's divide by A2. A2. Why is that? It's a cubed number. And two, 2 to the power 3 is 8, yes. <laughs> <laughs> this will be of a whole sphere. This is one eighth of a sphere. Surface. No, not the surface. It has nothing to do with the surface. I'm actually calculating the volume. Oh. But this here is the mathematical formula for, for the volume of a whole sphere. And we're only taking one eighth of it. Why 1 8? Now, it's because these n's start with uh, n is 1, n is 2, n is 3, n is 4. No negative n's. That allows only that part of the sphere that lies in the positive x, uh, kx, ky, and kz, kz direction. It gives you 1 8 of the sphere. So the volume of the sphere is this number. In fact, we already know what this is, yes? 1 8, 4, 3, pi. The r is the uh, radius of the sphere. It's right there. <coughs> we call it K. So that's K to the third. This is the volume of the sphere, but again, this uh, it, uh, assumes that each point within the volume of the sphere corresponds to an allowed state, but they're discretized. So we have to divide this number by the volume that each state takes. So the number of states within that volume is that number again. Pi k to the power 3. Let's take a guess how much space one takes in. How much distance is between one k value to the next? The Coulomb proportion. Well, no, 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 no physics. This is full, no, it's full mathematics. Geometry. So you have one point here, you have one point over there. How much distance is, is there in between those two? It is on the board somewhere. Mm -hmm. Just the vector k. Pi divided by l. Just pi divided by l. You can see it here. The k's are divided from each other from one end to the next end. One integer then <coughs> to, the, to the next end. So the distance between two successive n values is when, or, or in other words, delta k, you would, you would say, is delta n. Delta n is 1. It's pi over L. So that's the distance between one allowed state to the next allowed state in one of the three directions. In a volume, that will be to the power 3. 
So we have to divide this by the distance between two end states. So that will be. Do you agree with this? Pi over L is the distance between two neighboring states, allowed states, within that volume. And because we're doing in a volume now, you have to do it to the third power for each of the three directions. So you could also say that each state itself occupies a k space volume of pi over l to the power 3. This is the full volume of the sphere. If you want to have the number of states in there, you have to divide by how much space each of these states takes in. So that's that number. We now are very far because we now have the amount of allowed states within this sphere. Okay, let's clean up a little bit. I would say well, I'm going to keep the numerical factors so 8, 4, 3, pi, k to the third, l to the third. l to the third, by the way, is just the volume, yes? Not the volume, oh, careful here, not the volume of k space. The volume of the box in normal space that the particle was put in. So let's call that v again, capital V, and then there's a pi to the third below. You get this expression. All right, we have the number of states. Number of states, we have this here. Now the density of states, almost there now, the density of states by definition is dn over dE. In other words, if you would shift the energy a little bit, how much extra states would you get? This is the definition of the density of states. This is that thing over there. Now we're almost there, yes? Because we have n, it's a function of k. k is itself a function of energy. So we should be able now to take the derivative. Let me write it down explicitly for a second. Um, if you would take dn, because we have this expression now, take dn, in other words, you change the number n, just a small amount. What you would get is 4 pi k squared Still agreeing? the derivative. Now k is related to the energy that's this thing here. So dk, check for yourself if you see why this is true, um, dk goes with, let me just write it down for a second, goes with um, dp over h bar. Do you agree with that part? K squared, phi over pi squared, dp. All of a sudden I'm putting a momentum in there. Why do, is that allowed? Yes, it's allowed, but can you tell why that's true? It's, it's not just mathematics, it's physics. physics. Why did you lose one uh, pi squared? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like you went from pi to pi squared. Uh, where? Which one? Oh, this one. Yes, uh, you're right. Excuse me. Yes. Okay. I cannot smuggle that one away by saying that some numbers happen to be one or something like that. I can do it with h bars and c's, not so much with pi's. You're right. Why this step? Heisenberg. No, 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 no. It's classical <laughs> physics. That's actually like Euclid. Uh, this one is this one is actually Euclid. Yeah. Uh, last time I was. Can we see it here? Energy is h bar over two m k squared. This is what we see here. Energy at the same time, this, this came directly from Schrodinger equation. But energy in classical physics, kinetic energy, is this number, p squared over 2m. 
So you can really see that k is uh, p over h bar. Why just kinetic energy, by the way? I'm, I'm now making the, the, the statement that the energy of a particle in this volume is just kinetic energy, no other kinds of energy. No potential energy. There shouldn't be anything inside it. Exactly. It it's an empty box. The only potential energy is at the boundaries of the box. So we can fully do this. Now, as a final step, so we are now no, no, that we can write this. As a final step, we can relate the P's to the actual energies if we, if we would like to. Yes? Let me do that step in a second. Let me just first write down what we have here. Finally, we have that dn equals v 2 pi over h bar to the power 3. I made another mathematical step in there. And I really need you to understand what happened here. Because I had a dn here. And turn it into a dp, but I turned to d3p. This case in all three directions. Yes, it's true. There's a d3p. And a d3p is always the same as 4 pi times p squared dp. This you know from your calculus. It's no physics, it's mathematics. So this step I used over here. Um, I uh, derived this particular expression because this was part of the exercise to show that this expression holds. All right, so that's good. This is only just for the electron. So we know now how many states there are that are eigenstates, uh, how many states there are that are eigenstates of momentum for a certain value of the momentum. The neutrino has a similar thing going on. So let's say that this one has momentum p, so we can use that expression. And this one here, we will say has momentum q. The same expression you can use, because this whole derivation also applies to the neutrino. Let me write them down here, that we have here that dn for the electron is v d3p over 2 pi h bar 3 in the same expression here. one. So again, P is the momentum of the electron, Q is the momentum of the neutrino. We were still looking for the density of states, how many final states there are. This one is related to the final amount of final states for the electron. This one is related to the final states for the uh, neutrino. The amount of final states period for the whole collection of things is just this one times that one. Yes? If there's four possibilities for the other, there's two possibilities for, for, for the next one, there's eight possibilities in total. <coughs> so what we have now is that the dn, p, e, d, and q gives you this monster expression. more. There's that thing there. But almost there at the point that we can turn this into a dn over de. We need one final thing. 
this is where physics come in, comes into play again. Namely, the P and the Q are related to each other. By conservation of angular, of, by conservation of momentum. You cannot just put any P and any Q in there. If you put more momentum in the P's, you get less momentum in the Q's. By the way, why did I put momentum on this one in? Or the phase space. Sorry? I did not put any phase space argument in this one. I didn't, they didn't, did not apply that formula to that one over there. Some so physical reason heavier. for that. Sorry? So much heavier, so it won't move like significant to the other two. Okay, so how does that relate to not having to take into account such an expression for this one? I mean, you're right. Well, it's just you? one exactly, there's only one end state if you assume that it won't recoil. And the probability of that thing recoiling is extremely small. Because this is some nucleus of 200 nucleons, and that one is uh, again of 200, of 200 nucleons. Sure, protons and neutrons have shifted around a little bit, but that's about it. So this thing is very, very much heavier. One nucleon by itself is already 2,000 times lighter than the electron. So that's 2,000 less recoil times 200 of these things. So this thing, its final momentum is pretty definitive. It's, it's, it's probably going to be zero. Yeah, assuming that you started out with zero momentum of that one. It's probably going to be zero, and there's exactly one way of doing that, because there's only zero. So it, it really just contributes a factor of one. Now we have now this combination of things, and again we have to uh, get these things together now. Get the P and Q's together. Now we're going to make the following assumption. that. This one has a definitive initial state, initial energy. This whole outcome has a definitive final energy. And that there's an energy difference between these two. Smuggling a little bit here. Let's say that this thing has a definitive final energy. And there's an energy difference between these two. We're going to call that delta E. So if this thing breaks apart and creates that thing, then there's delta E and the energy is still free to go somewhere. That goes into these two. Note that in our calculation up to this point of the density of states, we assumed that at the moment that they got this energy, this uh, difference in energy was distributed over these two, at that moment they're free particles. They don't feel each other anymore because we assumed here that they had no potential at the moment that they left. Okay, that's an assumption. It's a good assumption though, because it's all Weak nuclear force goes out, weak nu nuclear force doesn't do anything. There's some Coulomb attraction still going on between the proton and this one. But we're going to assume the thing flies off so fast that it's basically <coughs> a free particle from that moment on. So this everything holds. So the idea now is that we have this difference in energy that's in to dis be distributed over these two. That gives us a formula. It tells us that the difference in energy is equal to the energy uh, of the proton, uh, the uh, electron. There's a p here because I called that this momentum. I call p. I hope it doesn't confuse you. I don't mean proton. I mean the energy of the electron plus the energy of the neutrino plus something else. Suggestions. With this amount of energy, it has, to, has to go somewhere. What I'm doing here is I say what well, goes into the kinetic energy of these two decay products. Some heat. That would be nice. Uh, uh, as in, some it would just excite some. Yeah. some that, is that, is, that, is, that is true. But we're going to take, leave that out of the whole calculation. But you're right. I mean, it's, uh, it, it's there officially. What kinds of energy are there in the first place? <coughs> Kinetic energy. Potential. There's potential energy, but we're going to say that that one is zero because we're going to assume that they that these 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 two products don't feel the rest of the nucleus anymore. Binding energy. Well, the binding energy really is this, yes. 
the release of buying energy. No, that's the, again, that's the energy that's released. Okay, okay, yeah. <coughs> Is it just the energy of the particle itself? So yes. Like the MC, MC Yes. The, the mass. Equivalent. We've created an electron. Yeah. That costs energy. Yeah. So the mass of the electron times C squared. Yeah. That's where the, where the energy goes to. You're right, and, and, and this energy is, is given mm -hmm. by the fact that there was some weak decay going on. E, e, e and e Q. Yes. That uh, are changing. Yes. Okay, okay, okay. Now, again, these are going to be <coughs> kinetic energies, just kinetics. And do you know any way of relating kinetic energy to, uh, uh, to momentum? I'm going to smuggle a little bit here because I'm now going to switch to relativistic physics. So a relation that relates energies to momenta. We here used some classical thing, p squared over 2m. I'm going to switch now to relativistic physics. Some relation from relativity maybe? P squared, C squared. Uh, P squared, P squared, P squared, C squared, so this one. Yeah. E squared is P squared, C squared plus M squared, C to the fourth, yes? There you go. Another assumption. I'm going to assume that there is enough energy to be to go around, that the momenta that this one and this one gets, this one and this one is so big, that we can safely ignore the amount of uh, mass, this part. Yeah. We're going to leave this part out. Mm -hmm. Because neutrino is an extremely good approximation. Because the neutrino has well, sub-electron volt mass or so. It's a very small number. That allows us to write EP as P times C and EQ as Q times C. Like that in here. PC plus QC plus ME squared. Now the next exercise that I gave was then to prove how you can rewrite in this part and this part in terms of just energies. Yes? I'm very confused about that because initially you didn't ignore the electron mass when you were writing the expression for delta E. Yes. But then when you were writing the expression for E T that you, you ignored the electron mass. Yeah, so I'm sort of smuggling, yes? Mm -hmm. At one point I'm taking it along and at another point I'm not. Would you be happier if we de would be a bit more consistent if we just left this part out? Yes. All right. Just going to do that. It only gives about ten percent differences, so your final answer. So, but why don't we why don't we include it in both? I understand for the neutrino completely, but why yes. don't we just for the square root? We could. I mean, the, 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 the calculation doesn't become more more difficult. It's just at some point we we come across an integral that becomes mm -hmm. somewhat more difficult if you take the, to leave that part in. And I want to get to some final result. So I'm I'm, I'm really just paying okay. paying homage to the uh, um, the mathematics. Of course, you could just leave it in and get a more general expression. Sure, but you're right. Out of consistency, we should actually just leave it out. Now, okay. One of the exercises that I wanted you to do was then to show, can I erase, erase this? One of the exercises I wanted you to do was then to show that what the final expression becomes. Again, we have the number of final states here, that times that, but if we just leave it at this point, we have not taken into account the conservation of energy. If we do want to do that, let me just give you the answers first. You will find that dp, this one here, d3p, is given by 4 pi p squared. Now this one is easy, yes? This is really just this, plugging this expression in. And again, ignoring for now the, uh, the masses of the, uh, the thing. 
And it's very much the same way. D3Q is four times Q squared, DEQ over C. And if you want, you can then plug in this relation here, the conservation of energy. Of course, this is just playing around with algebra. There's no physics involved. You will get this expression. 4 pi delta E minus EP squared C to the third D delta E. Do, do you believe me when I tell you this? This one? How did I do that? What, what was the question? Yeah. How did I get from this to there? This one is easy, yes? I mean, d3q is 4 pi q squared times dq. dq you can rewrite as deq divided by c because of this relation. So this part is easy, but not this part. You just use that equation for exactly. the change of variable. I just put this one in. What I do do is that deq that we have here is, if you look at that relation, is delta E minus EP. And I write this as this one here. In other words, I'm assuming that EP is a constant. It is. As far as Q is concerned, P is a constant. So that turns DEQ into D, D delta E, and Q squared is just this expression squared. Then I get there. Now, once I've done that, I'm finally at the point where I want to be, <laughs> namely that dNP and dNQ, this huge expression that we had here in terms of momenta, I can now turn into an expression in terms of energies. See, there's all kinds of factors there, 2, 2 h to the third, that's that one. And the next one is 4 by Q C to the third delta E V time. Get this huge expression here. Now this number, in total, which is called D capital N, the, 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 the final number, the total number of possible outcomes. Mm -hmm. And we're now at the point that we can calculate the density of states. The density of states is, if you were to increase the amount of energy, how many more states would you get? So if we were to give the system a little bit more energy to create final states of, how much more states would you get? That's by definition the density of states. In other words, dn over d delta e, because this is the energy that the states are created from. And we now have a full expression. Uh, I have to clean up a little bit because there are all kinds of four pi's in there and everything. I hate those things. So what you get here is four squared, p squared. This is this expression. Cleaned up a little bit. Four to the power h six c to the power four. Delta E minus EP squared and so you get this. This is what you finally get. It's a long calculation, but we're there. Mm -hmm. Apart from the mathematics, is the physics clear? What we did. Because that is a very important step in this calculation that you understand why the physics works the way that it does. Again, we said we're going to assume that this particle and this particle are free, no potential energy. Then we said, okay, well, if they're free particles or, or momentum eigenstate, what we get here is that you cannot normalize them, so we're going to put each of them in a box. If you put them into a box, then you can count how many energies, how many states there are 
for a certain value of energy of that particle within that box. And it gave you this expression and that expression. Multiply it, you get the total amount of expressions of the whole final state, of the whole decay thing. You multiply these with each other, you got this expression. And the only thing that I did then was plug in the conservation of energy. Then you ultimately get this expression. That's the density of states. That's the physics. Why yes? Why were you allowed to do the d eq equals d delta e again? Uh, which step? This one? Like get uh, the whole thing in the corner. Okay, this one, the first equality sign is this conservation energy. This is yeah. this expression. The second one is that here there's a derivative here with uh, of delta e and a derivative of uh, ep. Oh, and yeah. And, and the energy of the p particle, as far as the neutrino is concerned, is a constant. In fact, here it is still in your final expression. Because I told you we have still one more integration to make. What we have now in this whole calculation is, given that you know what the energy is going to be of your electron, how many possible end states are, going to, uh, are there going to be for these two together? That's what we calculate, that's this number. Now we don't know how much energy is going to be given to the electron. The only thing we know is that there's going to be delta E energy distributed over the proton, excuse me, the electron in the neutrino. How much of this energy goes into the electron, we don't know. Hey, hoi. Hello. Hello. It's, it's my girlfriend. <laughs> she studied biology, but she feels like following some quantum physics. You know, as you do, as you're in, in biology. Okay, so back to your original point. Um, or maybe it's break time. What time is it? Now, we're going to have to do a big integration in a second, so maybe it's about time that we should break. But just let me make that final point again. What we have here is the amount of states, the amount of final outcomes that you could have, given that the electron will have this amount of energy, EP amount of energy. You don't know how much energy it will get. The only thing you know is that this amount of energy will, do, will be distributed over the electron and over the neutrino. You don't know how much each will get. Now, if you've given a certain amount to the electron, you don't have to worry about how much the, the, the neutrino will get because we already put that in explicitly when we did the calculation. We put in the law of conservation of energy. So we don't have to worry about that. At the moment that we choose a value for the amount of energy that the electron got, the physics or the mathematics will not automatically take care of how much energy the neutrino will get. Now there is of course more final products than just this number. Because we have to integrate now over all possible energies that the electron can get. From what value to what value, by the way? From here to here. What are the, the possible values that the energy could have? What's the least amount of energy that the electron could give, theoretically? Zero. Zero. <laughs> Final, what's the maximum amount that you could get? The initial energy of the whole system. Yeah, or the energy that was liberated when the thing fell apart, so that's delta E. So what we're going to do in a second, so we're going to do this integral here. Now we're going to plug this, because this of course is going to be the final density of states, we're going to plug this into here, and we get our Sargent's rule. Then apply it to some beta decay, we'll find some numbers. I did it last night, find the numbers. It was okay-ish. <laughs> the number didn't come out exactly as I wanted, but uh, we'll get close. Any questions so far? Why do we integrate it? Because without the integration, I have an expression for how, ma how many final states there are given that the electron has this amount of energy, EP. Ah. But I'm not sure how much energy the electron will get. I only know that it will be somewhere between zero and delta E. Mm -hmm. So in order to get all the possible outcomes, all the possible final states, I have to sum all the probabilities of all the energies in between. Here's a good question of people who really understand what I'm doing. Why is this not a summation? Why do I make turns into an integration? I'm summing. Why am I summing using an integral sign and not a summation sign? It's continuous. It's continuous, yes. The energy states are continuous. Why are they continuous? Or are they? You're nodding along as in yes. Is it because of my tone of voice that you think that the answer is probably going to be yes? Maybe. Maybe, okay. <laughs> 
I'm smuggling a little bit here. And I think that's a comment that you made last week. Yes, and the original problem that we were trying to answer yes. was a scattering state, so it was continuous. Yes. So we're disposing the, oh, this is because we dispose of the assumption that we're, so we're no longer in a box. No, exactly. Uh, we're smuggling a little bit here. That was a comment that you made last week. You might, all of you might remember, actually. But you made a very interesting comment last week. Because already last week, I already gave you the outline of how this calculation went. I told you it's going to be an integral. And then you, very snappily said, well, Sorry. no, that's fine. No, 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 so no, to be snappy is a good thing. And to be astute is even better. No, it was no, it was a good comment. You made the comment, well, if you integrate of these things, then you're assuming that this is a continuous spectrum of energies, yes? But if you put things in a box, that's the whole starting point of our calculation of the density of states, you assume, or you're assumed, quantum mechanics tells you that, it, that it's discrete. So I'm sort of breaking my own assumptions here. It should really just be a summation over all the energy states. But here's a cool thing. What if we make the box very, very big? Do you remember what the spacing was between two states uh, in the box? Pi over L. What if we make the box very big? This was related ultimately with some squares in between to the energies, yes? <coughs> just make the box infinitely big. <coughs> And then all of a sudden, the differences in energies become infinitely spaced, becomes continuous. You don't see convinced. Well, the, that's an interesting way of doing it. Tricks. <laughs> yes, it's, 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 a, no, it's a little mathematical trick or the theoretical physicists use, they really do. Um, but it's not smuggling, by the way. Because listen, the only thing no, that we did was we, we put a box around things. We never said how big the box was. Maybe the thing was, was, was infinitely big from the outset, yes? <laughs> I know, that's the worst kind of smuggling, but it's really, it's really the way that people do things. Mathematical, math, real mathematical people don't like these sorts of tricks. Because ultimately what we're doing here is originally in our box, I said put everything in a box. And we're going to have a break after this, but I'm going to put things in a box, do my whole calculation, and then at the end I say, well, the box is infinitely big, all right? Oh, it's fine, you can do this. You can just set put things in a box and then later on say, oh, by the way, the box is infinitely big. Sure, you could do that. But um, why mathematical people don't like these sorts of tricks is that somewhere in this calculation, I'm doing an integral. And going from here to there, I'm replacing my limit with an integral. And that is something you cannot automatically do. It works when you have an, when you have an, an, an integral that is between fixed boundaries if you don't integrate over infinite amounts themselves. Same thing with this, by the way. The limit of a summation is not necessarily the summation of a limit. You cannot just replace these things, swap these around. Or, quantum mechanically speaking, these, so these, these two operations do not commute. Yeah. It's, it's very clean and very in impressive, but just how would you come up with it? <laughs> it's, um, I don't know, it's something somewhere in the warped mind of the physicist. Somebody thought it was going to be There's a good idea. There's mathematical rules that allow you to do that. I forget the name of the theorem. The Dirichlet. No, 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 no. Not the Dirichlet condition, no. But similar to it. Um, it'll, come, it'll come in a bit. Cauchy? No, no, it'll come in a bit. Okay. Again, I told you the little trick or that my professor of mathematics, mathematical physics always told me. Uh, if, if you're not certain if something is mathematically allowed in physics, just do the damn thing. <laughs> First, see if it gives you something that, that will help you along with the calculation. And maybe then worry if it was allowed or not. This is what we do. But yes, we are, we are sort of cheating. We're, 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 we're ultimately, what we're doing is we're swapping an integration and a, and, and, and a limit taking. And you could very well ask the question if that is allowed. But this is how we do it. Frobini is No, 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 no. Frobini is no, no, no. Fro if you want to switch. Are you sure? Yeah, that's what you require if you want to switch the limit and the integration. Or is this limit and the. And, and, the, and the integration, yes. Integration. Um, Isn't Frobenius theorem that you can always write the solution of a differential equation as a power series? No, 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 method. Oh, that's Frobenius. Yeah. That's yes. uh, That's that's when you have a power series and you truncate it at some yes, point. Exactly. That's not Frobenius theorem. That's um, it has a different name, but similar. All right. Well, it's just semantics, of course. Uh, <laughs> So here we are. So when we get back from the break, what we're going to do, we're going to actually evaluate this integral and then finally get to our Sargent's rule. And then going to plug in some numbers, see if it works for a given beta dk. See if we get the right number out. So what time shall we reconvene? Does that clock work?
Yeah. yeah. That oh my god, it works. It does. It does. We checked. 5 2. This is 5 2. Yep. I have a mixture of Frobenius method and Frobenius theorem. So there is, there is I know what you're talking about. So it's the same thing when you're, with me doing it think when you're solving for the hydrogen atom at some point you use that equation. Yeah, if you do the radio equation, yeah, exactly. And you, you yeah. can get the see that at some point you can Yeah, exactly. Come on! Any, but that's... <laughs> All right, so did the whole calculation. <laughs> I am going to raise everything except for the parts we're going to need, which is the Fermi Golden Rule that we have right here, and this density of states that we derived just a second ago. All right, there we go. So the plan, I'm going to put in these things, put this density of states in there, uh, over here in the Fermi Golden Rule, do the integration, to see what comes out. And well, I already told you what we told you was going to come out, it's the Sargent Rule. In fact, we're already there, right? I mean, does anyone have any, have any difficulty doing this, this calculation here? Will come out of here? Should be, shouldn't be too difficult. You see, there is a p squared in there, and there's an ep in there. We have to integrate of all possible eps, yes? We can consider this a constant for a second. Just do the calculation. But of course, if you multiply this out, you will get ep squared at the very least. That's one of the terms that's going to be in there. And what you're also going to get is multiplied with another p. But you know that ep and p are themselves related by this relation that just Start away from the board. So, if you just look at this, many things are going to be outside of the integral, all the h bars and everything. So, what we're going to have is that the v squared is over there, 4 pi to the fourth is over there, h bar to the sixth is over there, another c is over there, big number. And if you multiply this out with the p squared, you will get at the very least p squared times ep squared. DEP. You will get this. But you know that P squared itself is EP uh, divided by C squared. Yes? Again, I'm making an approximation now. I'm going to assume that there's enormous amounts of energy to be given to the electron so that it becomes relativistic. So as energy is mostly in its momentum. So you have this. So what you get here is an integration of EP to the fifth, uh, excuse me, to the fourth, integrated over EP. Ultimately, will give you e t e p to the fifth power. That's almost this expression right here. It's also fifth power. One difference. This is the amount of energy to be distributed. That one. This is the amount of energy of the electron. So there's a difference there. You look confused. You'll evaluate it at delta. Yeah. Exactly. That's the answer. Oh. That's all. So you do this calculation, do the integration, Evaluate it at this value because that's the maximum amount you will get. Yes. So ultimately, what you will get here is delta e p to the fifth. That's what you will get. That's exactly that rule here. Now, if you do the full calculation, and again, this is just algebra, so I'm just going to give you the result. The actual number that comes out is this one. So here's the full. Fermi Golden Rule with everything put in there. 2 pi over h bar to the seventh. Ridiculously small number, by the way. And I'll get back to this in a second. There you go. Modulo squared. Um, Excuse me, this this one I was doing. Then this whole thing over there, v squared, 4 pi to the fourth, h bar to the sixth, c to the fourth, e p to the fifth. And I promise you what the actual number is going to be. Uh, let's see if I do this correctly. It's going to be divided by 
Siksi. You might have to think about this for a second. Why it's sixty? It's not that hard, though, because when I just gave you sort of hand waving argument that it should be to the power of, uh, five, ultimately, I only took that part, this one here, took that to the power of five. <coughs> but of course, delta e squared itself also comes with a number of factors there. And you also get cross terms, delta E times EP. And the EPs, when you integrate them, have to be evaluated to delta E. So you get all kinds of delta E to the power something. They all end up to be delta E to the power 5, and each with another numerical factor. You combine all numerical factors, it will give you 60. So this is how you get that expression. Shouldn't the h bar? Yes, this is completely wrong. That h bar is that one over there. Let me, let me make my all time favorite excuse. They're one anyway. Right? <laughs> Just like the C's, don't worry about them. But you're right, let's see if I have everything correct. Now, 2 pi h bar to the seventh, yes. 4 pi fourth, c to the fourth. That's wrong. But then again, that one is unity as well. But it's to the sixth. There you go. It's to the fourth because yeah, of. Uh, yeah, well, anyway. Sixth because of the one in the side. Exactly, yes, that's it. Here's the full expression. So we're, we're very happy now, right? I mean, at the moment that I tell you how this nucleus that you started out with, what, what the thing is, the H1, this one in the fermi golden rule, that tells the thing to drop down and fall apart. If I tell you what the expression of that thing is, you can just put it in here, do the calculation. Of course, you have to put in, <coughs> you have to put in, of course, how much energy is being released. You get the number out. And the number that you will, will get out, remember all the way in the beginning, what the probability, probability is per unit time of this thing falling apart. This is called the decay rate, of course. The amount of times you expect it to happen per second. One over this number is the decay time. It happens this many seconds, after this many seconds. Here's the final one. There you go. The only thing we need is the perturbing Hamiltonian that tells the nucleus to fall apart. Now here's an approximation comes in, or assumption, or an ansatz, and that is done by Fermi, way before the full advent of quantum mechanics, let alone quantum field theory, or the weak nuclear force. Enrico Fermi thought, well, you know what? Pretty sure that must look something like this. H1 is equal to some number, it's coupling constant, we'll give you the, the value in a second, times capital M, it's not a mass, I will tell you in a second what it is, divided by v squared, uh, excuse me, divided by v. Now, dividing by v he did on purpose, because he already knew that we had to put all the end products, the electron and the neutrino, into a box. So he knew that the outcome would have a v squared in there somewhere, and he wanted just to divide that out. So he just put the v in there, for that reason alone. If you think, well, the guy was just smuggling, well, you're right. But at the same time, from a physical point of view, you know that the outcome, how often you expect this nucleus to fall apart, should not depend on how big the box happens to be in that you put the nucleus in, yes? So, from a physical point of view, it is a little bit of smuggling at the same time, it's what you, you just make an assumption based on what you would physically expect, that this beta emitter doesn't care whether it's, it's, it's emitting its particles, its electrons and its neutrinos in a big room or in a small room. That's basically what it says. That's why he put it there. This, of course, is a very ad hoc assumption that it, it's the same decay for all uh, decays. It says something about the, uh, the weak nuclear force, that apparently, as far as the weak nuclear force is concerned, it doesn't care too much about neutrons or protons and how they stick together. This number here um, is a number that says something about how much the initial nucleus and the final nucleus, so the thing that, that you're left over with, differ from each other. Or in, put it in quantum mechanical terms, it's an overlap integral. This thing says something about the final state of the nucleus and the initial state of the nucleus. How much these two are alike. You can maybe imagine that if you have a very big nucleus, right, so uh, some high mass isotope, the changing one proton into one neutron will not differ much. And this thing will become of order unity. 
Then again, if you have a small amount of protons and neutrons, then changing one proton in a neutron does make a lot of difference, or makes more of a difference. In that case, this number becomes typically around the value of 3 or 4 or so. But that's about the range that you will get. So what we're going to do is take this thing as a constant, this matrix element. Or, or if you really want to know the number, you have to do qu full quantum field theory with the new weak nuclear force in there. But for us, we're going to just say, well, it's some number of the order unity. Then plug everything in. You get this. So I'm just going to say that the thing is just one by itself. So I'm just going, going to throw it out. The V's cancel each other out. You get the G squared. It's now called the Fermi coupling constant. Divided by 5 pour, uh, to the power pour, 4, 6, delta E to the power 5 over 60. And this is your decay rate for beta decay. It's up to experiment to determine what this number is. This here. I will give you the number now, because experiments have, have told you what it is. While I do that, this is a little factoid. It was for me who really gave the first mathematical model using this new thing called quantum mechanics in the 1930s for this particular decay. Weak nuclear forces had not been fully identified, but it had already been seen the protons can turn into neutrons. And he did this his whole calculation and thought, okay, well, it's probably going to be something like this, even though he didn't know what really happened under the hood of things. This is what quantum field theory was for later. But it's a good approximation. Now G is 166. GeV over 1 over the, the square of GeV, that's the unit, but for reasons that has to just have to do with history, the number that I gave you now is not just G, it's G over HC to some power. I have to look up the power because, and now I'm really not joking, for me these numbers are just 1. So I just know G without the H bar and C, so I have to just look it up for a second. Um, yeah, to the power 3. So experiment tells you that this is about the value of G is. There you go. Question to you. I'm now going to apply this formula, get some number out. And question to you then is, how do I get delta E? How do I get this number? You know this number, I know everything. How do I get that number out? So I give you nucleus, I tell you that, that it decays via beta minus. How do you get the number out? Mass defect. Sorry? It's the mass defect. It's the mass defect, exactly. The whole thing that, that you end up with has less mass than the thing that you started out with. I'm making again an assumption, and that is that the thing that you started out with, the nucleus, is in its ground state. So it doesn't have any excess energy because of, you know, nucleus being some in some higher shell or anything. So everything that I'm talking about now is just ground states. But yeah, the mass defect. Just look at what the mass of the original nucleus, you look at what the mass of the final nucleus plus the electron that you created, remember that's what we also put in the delta E, calculate the thing, the mass effect, multiply with C squared, you get delta, you get delta E. So I have a numerical example, waiting in the wings. We can also just be frivolous and just take any example now, just look, up, look one up on the internet or something like that. You know, let's do that. Sure. Just take any beta emitter. Lead. Lead? This, this, is, this is your favorite example, yes? <laughs> one particular isotope of lead, too? 213. Yeah, okay, the stable one. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> and give up. <coughs> Well, just look for any for any nucleus, or any isotope that decays via beta minus. Could also be beta plus. I don't care really. I mean, the formula works for both. I thought we were looking for lead now. Oh, <laughs> sure. We can, we can use lead. I mean, I found lead too. I don't. I don't even know if it's a beta emitter. <laughs> I'm just making it up. All right. <laughs> It's a numerical example. Uh, 
the one that I looked up for myself was 74 Krypton, because superheroes. Uh, Superman came from Krypton, the planet Krypton. And it so happens that that is a beta plus. What do you have another one? Uh, there was beta minus here, which said that it from 14 carbon into... Oh, oh that's nice. Four, yeah, 14 uh, carbon? Nitrogen 14. Okay. Uh, the carbon is 7, yes? Uh, 6. 6, okay. Oh, and nitrogen is 7? Yeah. Okay. So it goes to 14 nitrogen. Uh, let's see, turn the pro, uh, pro uh, neutron into a proton. So it's it's minus. Yeah. Okay, there it is. All right. Okay, we're going to do this real time, yes? Because the example that I had calculated beforehand was Krypton. Let's see how well this one works out. I have no idea. Mine was right up to about an order of magnitude. The outcome should have been about 11 minutes. And I got three minutes or so, something like that. It's close-ish. But as you can see from the calculation, you easily lose a factor of three or somewhere like that. But sure. All right. Well, let's start with the delta E. We have to calculate that number. If we know that number, just plug it into our Sargent's rule, we get everything. So what is the mass of 14,6 carbon? I don't know these numbers by heart. I mean, I can make a good estimation by saying, well, it's about 14 times the mass of a proton or so. It doesn't say here. Just gonna have to calculate it. But what I typically do is go to Wikipedia and say isotopes of carbon. And then it gives you isotopes and gives all the, uh, the values. So somebody who can in the meantime look up what the mass is of 14 nitrogen. Yes, thank you. And I could also do with the mass of the electron. That would, that would be good too. Of course, that's a number you know by heart, yes? It's 9.1 times 10 to the power minus 31 kilograms. You're right, this is about 500 kV. 511 kV. Okay. I could have made a good estimation last time when we were discussing that because I know yeah. the proton is about 1 GeV and the electron is about 2,000 times lighter, so. Oh, that's true. Yeah. I just remember it from the uh, annihilation peak in the <coughs> Yeah, that's what you said last time, yeah. Is it on big map? Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, sure. So nitrogen is 14.00 meters. I don't know how many decimals you want. Uh, d d d d give me about five. And 14.00307. Okay, that's in atomic mass units. Yeah. Okay. And this is for nitrogen? Carbon is 14.00324. Can you see why I wanted this many decimal places? It's, all, it's very small mass differences. Of course, small mass differences become big energy differences because of the c squared, yes? All right, so what's the difference? We can sort of do this by heart. That's a difficult calculation. Um, hmm. um, I'm, I'm guessing 17-ish or so? 1.7 times to the minus four, something like that? Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's right. Let's take one decimal extra. And it should... 1.71. 7.1 to the minus 4, yes? Yep. Okay, so it's in atomic mass units. Of course, we have to put in things in kilograms, or that would be better, because we now have the Fermi constant here in GeVs. We have to put in masses uh, in, in GeVs. That's what we need to do. So it would be nice if we can convert this to GeVs. There's many ways that you can do this, of course. There's numerical factors uh, squeezing somewhere in between, some H bars maybe or something like that. What I typically do is just convert it first to kilograms, do it times C squared, get the energies in joules, and divide by the amount of joule in one GeV. So one U is about 166 times 10 to the powers minus 27 kilograms. to the power minus 31. Yeah, I got 2.839. 839, so 84, something like that. This is in kilograms. OK. 
Okay. Oh, wait, 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 wait. We've got about the mass of the electron. So this is the mass difference between the carbon and nitrogen, but we still have to create an electron. So the amount of energy that we still have left to turn into kinetic energies is this number minus the, the mass of the electron. So we're going to subtract from this um, uh, 9.1 minus 31. Seems a little bit of, this number seems to be too big. Are you sure about this? Minus. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah? The internet does. Uh, uh, this number for the electron, you mean? Yeah, for the electron, kilograms is 9.1 times, times 10 to the negative 31. 31, okay, so, okay, props to me, I knew this were hard, but how about this? Uh, this one, that one. Yeah, because this implies that the fine mass is more than this. Yeah, exactly, so, so there's, there's something off in our numbers, otherwise we are breaking the law of conservation of energy here. Mm -hmm. Or the intent is lying in this decay was never possible to begin with. Somebody help me out here. Maybe you should just use the approximation where we use the atomic mass, like 14 times the mass of a proton. At least that way. Maybe we should do that. But before that, before we do that, as a sort let's of, see let, let's see if there's something correct. So <coughs> somebody please check these numbers. Again, it's an uh, ad hoc calculation here. I prepared a different one, so I'm not, cannot guarantee that everything on the board is correct. Can we just write them all directly in uh, GEV? Yeah, sure, we could do that too, but that, that shouldn't matter, of course. Yeah. I mean, ultimately, uh, yeah. well, of course, if, if you, the more conversion you do along the way, the more... In yeah. yeah, exactly. There's there's more running off errors, and there is more chances of you just you know typing something wrong or something like that. Well, life would be much better if this is to the power of minus thirty. But it, that's something I would but expect much more. There's a between these two. This is, this is just from the top of my head. Was I correct in, in saying those to the power minus four? Yeah. Yeah, maybe it should be. The zero zero is correct too in both cases. With the carbon, <coughs> it should be. <coughs> but I, I tried adding up the new the mass of the nitrogen and the okay. before it's already over. Okay, in that case, there's something else going on. It's an open question because I don't know the answer to myself. What could be wrong here? Because what we have now, if we are to take the number seriously we took from the internet, we have a situation where we create more energy than we started out with. Should we use the, um, the electron is going with a certain momentum, which is going with a certain relativistic uh, velocity. Yes. So it should be a little lighter than... Uh, than the rest mass, no? It should be heavier. It should be heavier, and I didn't say much. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Was it some excited state that this decay happened? Because you have certain decays, beta decays, that only occur at excited nucle nuclei. If you look so up in isotope uh, tables, you would typically find that this nucleus can fall apart in such and such, and this excited nucleus, same nucleus being in an excited state, can fall apart in a different way. Did you by accident take one that was in an excited state that already had extra energy to begin with? No, I just Google carbon 14 right. and on Wikipedia, the first isotope last it. All right, in that case... Doesn't mention anything. No, in that case, I'm just going to use my own example. There's something going on here, and I'm not sure what it is. I'm going to use my own example. Same idea, though. Mine was a krypton. I am interested in, in what was going on here, but let's go through this example first. The one that I took was 74 krypton. It's a beta plus, and it goes to 74 boron. Br, is that boron? Bromium or something like that. Bromium. I'm, I'm not a chemist, I never know these things. Mm -hmm. So I usually just make up what it says. It's probably 
brakken of something like that. I mean something. Okay, you get a positron one out and a neutrino. There you go. Now it's not an antineutrino but an actual neutrino, but that doesn't matter for our calculation. If you look up the mass, in exactly the same manner that we just did before, 73933084 U in atomic mass units. This of course is looking up these things. Well, a very bad idea is to take the number of protons and neutrons, see what the mass of each is, and then add them together. It gives you sort of a rough estimate. Not a rough estimate, it's actually pretty good usually. But we're looking for very, very small differences here in, in masses. And in our crude approximation, we're saying, well, the mass of this thing is just the, the, the sum of the mass of its constituents. You're throwing away the binding energy part, the semi empirical mass formula. And usually that's not too bad because some empirical mass formula tells you that each nucleon has about 7 MeVs or so in a total amount of, of, of some bigger number. So you don't usually have to worry too much about that. But in this particular case, where we're going far beyond the decimal point, you're much better off just looking at them up in tables. Now this number is 73.92989 in atomic mass units. And then this mass difference I hope you don't mind that I go through this a little quickly because this, of course, is algebra looking up numbers. It's about this, this mass difference. Again, in atomic mass units. Now, the mass available now for, well, let's call this available mass, available mass, is this mass or its energy to be more correct, minus the part that you have to convert to actually make the positron. So you have to subtract from this at least the mass of the positron, which in atomic mass units is to the power minus 4. That number is 5, 4, 8, 8 to the power minus 4. And the total amount of uh, mass that is then available becomes this number 2, 6, 4, 5, 6, power minus 3, u. This is what you will get. Again, this is algebra. I'm going to convert it now into GeVs. How much energy does that mean? So the available energy, which is exactly what in our Fermi Golden Rule and our Sir John's Rule is going to be delta E, the, the energy that you have still have left, have free to attribute to either the electron or the neutrino's kinetic energy, then in GVs is going to be this number 2.4712 minus. There you go. Let's just do the math. Again, I'm going to take this number, this bracket, to be 1. Right? It's probably a little bit higher, though, because it's a relatively small nucleus. So that means that turning one proton into a neutron or the other way around really does change a little bit what this bracket is going to be. The final state and initial state are somewhat different, so it's probably going to be around factor 3 or so, something <laughs> like that. But from a numerical point of view, the order of magnitude is <coughs> unity. Okay, just plug it in and do the math. That's all you have to do. Again, nothing interesting going on here. Just put in the numbers. What you will get is that big W, the decay rate, is about 0.0614. And this is divided by, have to divide it by another 10. There you go. 0 0.0614 per second. Excuse me, should be another zero in there. This is what you will get if you just do the algebra. This is the decay rate. This is how often per second you expect one of these cryptons to fall apart and form this bracket on. How do you get half-life out? It's not a half-life, this means related to it, but how do you get it out? It's an exercise that we did two weeks ago. Do you agree with me that 1 over omega is going to be the decay time? How many seconds it takes before successive falling apart? Something like 
like this, yes. So this is the amount of seconds per two krypton nuclei to fall apart. It's that number. Typically, people call this number lambda. We call it lambda too in one of the exercises. And lambda was related to the half-life. Mm -hmm. Relationship is as follows. Lambda, or the half-life, excuse me, is the logarithm of two times lambda. Of our second solution set, this was the first exercise, 1a, to prove that this was true. I put them on a lame yesterday, by the way, the word solutions or everything, so if you're not, not sure where this comes from, you can just look it up. Okay, uh, logarithm of 2. Any mathematical geniuses now around to know what this number is by heart? We have these people. Just look. look at me being a mathematical genius. Of course. It's, it's, a party trick. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a nice party <laughs> trick, exactly. Now, this number, this number occur, occurs so frequently in nuclear physics and in, in radioactive uh, physics that you just know this by heart. It's not like I actually can calculate these things or anything. It's 0 0.693 times this number. There you go. And let's see. This is 0 0.6 divided by 0 0.06. So it's about 100 difference. It's about 100 seconds, something like that. So one minute half or so. If you do the calculation, I think it's about 94 seconds or something like that. Order of magnitude estimation, yes. It's 112 seconds. Well, how much? How 112 seconds. 112. Okay, cool. Thank you. 112 seconds. Yeah, so that's about uh, that's a little less than two minutes. If you look up what the decay, the half life is of Krypton, you will find it's about 11 minutes, 10 minutes or something like that. Is that a bad thing? I mean, it should have been 10 minutes. We got two. Really hope you're going to say no. It's not a bad thing. You did well. <coughs> just do me a favor. Can, can, can somebody just say for a second you did well? Oh, good. Oh, thank you. Good job. Okay, thank you. <laughs> 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 no, here's the thing. Um, as I explained before, because of the fifth power of delta E, it's extremely sensitive to even the smallest miscalculation. Not, not even miscalculation. The numbers that you put in are, it are extremely important for the number that you, you will get out. You very easily lose factors. So the best thing that Sargent's rule gives you, if you're not ridiculously careful with how many decimal places you take into, you, into account, it will give an order of magnitude estimation. So in that sense, 10 minutes and, uh, and 2 minutes are really in the same ballpark, especially if you go and look up what the range is of beta half-lives. I did that. I just went through a couple of them. And just to give you some idea. By the way, this is the end of the calculation. I mean, you, you, you see you get pretty close. Yes? Um, in the mass difference that you've calculated, does that include the um, mass difference due to the electron as well? Yes. Or the positron? Yes. Okay. That's in there. The, I just compared because the 73.92, that's just the bromine? Yes. But not the yeah, the electron I put here. So oh, this is the mass okay. difference between the, the, the nuclei, and this is the, the electron. I see. So there you go. You, you see, by the way, that, that this already makes a difference. I mean, it's one decimal place behind, right? So that typically gives you an order of magnitude of 10% off. And you think, well, 10% is not that much, but you have to do it to the fifth power. And if you take a first order data series, it gives you about five times difference. So it's extremely sensitive. And this, of course, is exactly the reason, as I explained before, that you have this huge range in half-lives. Here's a couple of numbers. 26 aluminium, T1 half, this is, just look this up, it's about 7.2 to the power of 5 years, 720,000 years, it's a large number. Um, here's another one, um, 91 PD, how do you put that is? 10 milliseconds. Here's an interesting one. Six 
see iron. Now, semi-empiric mass formula tells you that iron is, is usually a pretty stable thing, yes? And it is. Look what the half-life is. This one. This is a beta minus, by the way. It's 2.6 million years. So yeah, that's pretty stable. All right. Here's another one. You take the same iron, take one neutron off. So you get 59 iron. Extremely amusing. 45 days. You, you, see, you see what differences you get? So really, it is because of this part. That small difference in mass, even though the rest is the same, gives you this amount of, of difference. But I'm, I'm pretty sure that something else is going on here as well, because this is a huge difference. So we're going to use our little party trick here at the moment that something doesn't really line up with our original calculations. It's probably some magic number issue or something <laughs> like that, yes? <laughs> so it's probably, I'm pretty sure it is a magic number thing. Now, one final example, and that is uh, this one. I took 103 CD. I think it's cadmium or something like that. Yeah? Yeah, okay. <laughs> no, there's, there's a story involved. There's an, um, um, one of my colleagues is a chemistry teacher. And I made him a cake. she made him a cake for his birthday when he turned 49. And 49 times with his cadmium. So that is a big uh, cadmium cake. <laughs> there was no actual cadmium there because it's highly <laughs> poisonous. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the guy is no yeah. yeah. the, the yeah. still yeah. around. But <laughs> he's out of interest. Order of magnitude of the, of the age of the universe. Do you just happen to know what that number is? Long time. No, that's 13. true, but we don't. 13.6 billion years? 13.8 billion years. Okay. With <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, billions of years, yes? So that's, 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 that's to the 12th. Nine, that's um, this is to the power 15 years. Oh, yeah. A bit longer. Yeah, it's longer <laughs> than the age of the universe, yeah. <laughs> now look at, the, look at this difference. It's huge. So in, in that regard, that beta minus and beta plus gives you this enormous range, 10 milliseconds versus longer than the age of the universe. I'm not worried about two minutes versus 10 minutes. <laughs> That's actually pretty close. <laughs> so given context, I'm very happy with that result. Okay, be that was that full exercise, see. sorry? To see if you can find a, pl like a cadmium piece that has like, reached its half time already or not. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's quantum mechanics. I mean, there, there is a non-zero probability that if I take a piece of cadmium, then two minutes later we'll already have decay. Yeah, it's true. just not very, uh, not very likely that it, but that will happen. But yes, the probability is there. Well, okay, we have two hours left. Tutorial. So, we're going to see how the alpha calculation went, because what we have now is a full method to calculate half times coming from beta decays, yes? Just, I want you to, for, before I let you go, just appreciate what we started out with. We started out with principles of quantum mechanics, a Hilbert space. We saw, said, well, we have these quantum states, you can span a space with this, this and these are the axioms, blah, 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 did the calculation, did the math, got the Fermi golden rule, put in some assumptions, now we have decay rates. And they sort of, well, sort of, they pretty well line up with the measurements. So we did a very big step, so that's for, for beta. Alpha, well, we're going to see what you got out, yes? See what happens. So I suggest in the tutorial lecture we will uh, start with you guys, is that okay? Mm -hmm. All right, and then we have still one hour left and I can tell you something about the uh, selection rules. Again, it's not quantitative, it's just rules. That's it. So see you in 25 minutes, the other side.